Well, today we're going to look at a short passage in Matthew, although we're going to talk about the verses a little ahead of it and after. Um, and so we'll be hearing Jesus teach an important, uh, important lesson to people who think they're healthy. So that might be us, and uh, might think that we're spiritually right, because uh, we're good at church attenders. Um, and uh, so we're here at the worship center today to worship together. But Jesus is speaking to us, maybe, in this passage, um, and know that we all need Jesus in different ways. So let's share God's word together. When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Amen. Well, everyone deals with rejection. I would guess that there's no one here who has not felt rejection at one time or another. You got passed over for the promotion at work. The deal didn't work out. They never called for a second interview. Your teacher didn't like your project idea, or she didn't like how you were behaving. (laughs) Friends gave you the thumbs down for your idea of a place to go out to. No, it stinks. Or a movie you wanted to watch. You pick a restaurant, but nobody wants to eat there. It's hard. And if you have a cat, I'd say you pretty know rejection. (laughs) I love cats, but cats can teach you how to be rejected. (laughs) Right? Cats, they do their own thing. So you have to learn how to deal with rejection. Now, if you've been hurt by rejection... There are ways that we respond to it. You might try to avoid it. You might change your performance so that you can avoid being rejected. You might try to act more pleasant or different so that people will accept you. You might try to please them by choosing to do things or say things that that you wouldn't normally say or do that might lead to things that you wouldn't normally participate in. But you might do that just to get along with people or to please them. And you might then also turn the other way if you've been rejected. You might start being kind of a bully. You might be punishing others, or you might show rejection to them uh, to show that it doesn't hurt. Or you might just pretend it doesn't matter at all. You know, rejection is painful in that it steals our hope. It can make us feel like we don't have any opportunities left. Like, what's the future hold for me when people are so rejecting of me? And we see that in people, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic, and in our culture in general, we see that, that there's a group of people that are really feeling uh, rejected uh, by society as a whole. And it might surprise you. It surprised me who I think are some of the people that really deal with rejection right now are young men. Uh, young, young white men, especially, are dealing with the feelings of rejection, and how can we help them? Because it impacts the future. It impacts our, our world. It impacts the hope we have. But the good news we have today, and I have every day, but we especially have it today, is that God has a better plan. God can help you deal with your rejection and your feeling with rejections and can help others. And we can help others by introducing them back into the kingdom and to God's plan for them. You know, God has better things for you. The great truth of our great God is he does not reject us. In fact, he's always inviting us to come. And that's probably the most amazing thing to me about our faith is that God welcomes us even when we really have rejected him or we really have turned away from him and done what we wanted to do. God's still saying, you can come back. And in fact, the scriptures are full of when you repent, when you turn back to the Lord, God is right there, ready to receive you all through history. And it's an an amazing part of who our God is, that rejection you, we reject God a lot more than God ever will reject us. And so 
when we look at how to deal with rejection, we can look at Jesus. How did deal, Jesus deal with rejection? Well, Jesus dealt with rejection by sticking to his purpose. Jesus did not ever adapt to other people to modify and, and appease them so he wasn't rejected by them. And in fact, Jesus also offered acceptance to people who others had rejected, like in our scripture passage for today. Jesus went and ate with tax collectors and sinners, and that caused Jesus to even be more rejected by the Pharisees and leaders of the church at that time. In fact, Jesus knew people and called them friend. He offered them a new perspective, a new hope. And for those who rejected Jesus, like the spiritual leaders, he offered them an opportunity and a growth area. We can learn from Jesus how we better can handle rejection. First and foremost, like Jesus, we need to be confident that God loves us, that God does not reject us, that God is welcoming us into his family. And a Jesus was confident above that, above all others, that the Father loved him. Well, God loves us too. That's our first and foremost strength. And that Jesus is the living proof of that love. That God's love for us knows no boundaries. And he does not reject us. Jesus' ministry was all about healing, casting out demons, and preaching. His teaching was like no other. He had such authority because he was convicted of the truth. He was powerful and moving in how he preached. And he offered a wonderful and life-giving opportunities for all people. He healed people who were sick with terrible diseases like leprosy and other diseases that have broken their families. Think about how life-giving that would be if you've ever done, dealt with a chronic illness. You know if someone recovers from something that's been a long time in coming, that how lifting, that lifts everyone up and fills you with joy. Have you not known, seen healing like that? I have. But we often have to deal with things long term. But when healing comes, we know it can be joy for all. And when we watch Jesus' ministry, we know that he never turns anyone away. When Jesus is interrupted in the middle of his ministries, he never says to someone, can't you see I'm busy? Why are you bothering me? Now the disciples invite Jesus to take that attitude sometimes, but Jesus never does. Instead, he stops and heals, sometimes instantly, sometimes by his thoughts, or sometimes by just the simple words. Sometimes he touches people and, and, and heals them in that way. But he stops and brings healing to the people that he encounters. People understand Jesus' power. And they're very aware of their unworthiness to stand before him. They are willing, though, to take the risk of rejection um, for their great needs to be met for healing. You know, they take risks to come to Jesus at times. The leaders of their faith community ostracize them and tell them, what are you? and even the disciples sometimes reject them. But Jesus never does. He always welcomes people in, and he calls people that we don't expect. And so that reminds us that Jesus will welcome you. He will welcome you and I if we turn to him. That's our great faith, friends. He'll welcome anyone that's in our life situation if we can encourage them to turn to him. Jesus receives all who come with physical ailments, but most shockingly is all that he invites who come with moral issues that have led to rejections from, from all sorts of people. And today's story is exactly about that. Jesus makes unexpected choices and his success is very different from what many of us would consider success or the world would consider success. He calls uh, people that is outside of how the normal church works. He calls people to follow him that others have rejected very clearly. And the first one that we look at is today's Matthew, the tax collector. He's an example of that. Now, I don't know about you all, but I've been working on my taxes you better get at it. The 15th is coming. <laughs> now, I don't also know about you, but about me, I have never met anyone who worked for the IRS. 
Now, there's got to be people who are family related to people who work for the IRS because there are people who work for the IRS. We have a tax accountant that we use because of our clergy taxes and stuff, and he's really nice. He's a good Christian guy. We know him. We've seen him at meetings, and he participates in annual conference and stuff, and we would love to go out to dinner with him. But when I think about going, I would. He's really nice. But when I think about going out to dinner with someone who works for the IRS, yeah, that's not exactly who the first person I'm going to invite, right? Yet that's, Jesus gets invited to go eat with the people who are tax collectors. Now at that time, we may not like our, tax, our IRS tax collectors, but I would say they're, I would think they're very ethical because of all the rules they follow. But in Jesus' day, the tax collectors were not ethical. In fact, the way they made their money was by overcharging you. And they, that's how they made their living. And so many of them were very rich because they were good at overcharging people. And they were what we consider moral outcasts in that society. And Jesus welcomes them in. He goes and eats with them when he's invited. And he tells people that their sins are forgiven. No one can forgive sins, but God alone, the religious leaders remind Jesus. He's speaking blasphemy. If you want your sins forgiven, you need to sacrifice. There's a process. You can't just say you're sorry and it's over. There's some suffering that needs to happen. There's a time. There's a place. It's a process. Not Jesus just simply saying to someone, your sins are forgiven. What are you doing, Jesus? And he does it at all sorts of places. On the street. On the Sabbath. He has no boundaries on when he's going to offer these healings and declarations to people. And so it's just not right for Jesus to be behaving this way as a holy person, as a rabbi. You just don't spend time and you don't accept dinner invitations from people who have blatantly turned away from God's law. Jesus, don't do it. Jesus is like this naive little angel. You don't hand flowers to the devil. Stop doing it, Jesus. These people have made choices that got themselves outside. They chose to work for the Roman government. They chose to be tax collectors. They chose to turn against a religious community. Is Jesus naive? No. Jesus is always operating with a purpose. And I think that's the key for us. Are we always operating with a purpose? We need to remember that Jesus is always focusing on his purpose. And the purpose is to bring people into the kingdom. The purpose is to overcome their rejections in whatever ways they present themselves, to bring healing and to bring them into the family of God. That is the solution Jesus always has to offer. And so these people are looking to Jesus for that solution, even though we might know it. But these people are looking at Jesus with judgment. And that might be us as good church people, because that's who they were, the good church people. When Jesus is doing these obviously good things, we, they were like, what are you doing, Jesus? This is not an appropriate way to do it. And Jesus has a solution for them, too. People who are harsh in their judgments of others or themselves. Jesus says this to them. I have come not for sacrifice, but for mercy. That's what God desires. That passage comes from Hosea chapter 6, where Jesus says, understand this scripture. And what it, what it is, is for the Lord calling them back. And you come back not through judgment, but through mercy. Through God's great mercy, we're invited back in. And so if our exclusions, if exclusions come out of our mouths in this passage, if we are the ones rejecting others, we might need to hear this. How can I learn to show mercy? How can I learn to be more compassionate towards others? How can I learn to forgive? You know, rules are needed. There's certainly no, nothing about Jesus that says what these people did was good or right. 
Jesus is about transforming their lives. But he doesn't transform them through condemnation. He transforms them through grace. And so rules bring about good things, and we need rules to follow, but rules also need to be examined closely. We need to stretch and grow to not put so many limits on how God might operate and who God welcomes into his family and his kingdom. If we're not outcasts, if we're in, and we might work hard to be in, like I said, we might be a people pleaser, then we might not understand how amazing it is for the people that God does where he can. Because we like this word. Oops, my picture fell off. Sinner. That's what we like to call ourselves sometimes and others. We reject people. We can't imagine how they could be forgiven. Especially if they've wounded us. How can we forgive them? They're doomed for hell. What's wrong with you? That's what they deserve. Or maybe someone's placed us in that category. I doubt it if you're here at church, because if you felt that way, you wouldn't probably enter the building. And that's the sad thing, isn't it? That's who should be sitting with us. People who think this is their label. But do we welcome them in? Or do we make it too uncomfortable for them to come? Jesus desires that we show mercy to ourselves and to others. Instead of harsh judgments, instead of insisting that we know the right way, Jesus wants us to show them grace. And now Jesus' mercy, again, does not mean that you're saying what they did was okay. It's not you saying that wasn't a sin. It's not some Pollyannish view. No. It does not mean that what others do does not matter. It does matter. Jesus' mercy, mercy isn't given if there's no sin. And no destruction. Mercy means that you're going to overlook the cost or the payment back to you. That you're going to trust God to take care of that. That you're going to live in God's love. And in God's love, you know firsthand how God is caring for you. And you're going to offer something that seems hard to offer, which is mercy to others. That you're not going to make them do some sacrifices or do some some payment back to you because they can't pay back for the wound that they've done you most of the time. Just like we can't pay back to God the wounds that we cause him for rejecting him. But instead, we can accept God's love and grace. We can come back to the Lord, and that empowers us then to live with a purpose. And our purpose is to help others come back and to be reunited with them and not to live in the strife that unforgiveness provides our world. Jesus always welcomes us when we come home. But do we welcome all others in? You know, we don't have to live under harsh mandates anymore. We're forgiven in Jesus' name. And that opens us up to live in a new way. We don't have to use this word anymore. You know, God is so familiar with rejection, you would think that he would be fed up with us, but instead he's not. Adam and Eve rejected God in the Garden of Eden. No, God, you don't know what you're talking about. We're going to eat what we want to eat. Throughout history, people have been turning away from the Lord all throughout the scriptures, and that's what led them to Hosea. They had just done whatever they wanted, worshipped whoever they wanted, done what they thought was right built altars and worshipped other gods, which seems weird to us, but don't we trust our money, our physical strength? Don't we trust our resources instead of turning to God? Time and again, they rejected to him. And then, of course, when Jesus came, when God sent his only son to us, think how God, he was rejected. In so many different ways, he was rejected. First, Herod tried to kill him when he was a baby, And then throughout his life, people were always rejecting him and and arguing with him. Even his own disciples, he had a hard time with that. And so we know the ultimate rejection happened to Jesus when he got convicted to go on the cross. The people cried out for Barabbas instead of Jesus. They took a rebel, a fighter, someone who caused problems and might even been a thief. Who knows? They took him over Jesus. That was probably, to me, would be the ultimate rejection which led to the cross. So Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected. But it isn't something he offers others. 
That's the amazing thing about our God. He knows rejection fully, so you know that God knows how you're feeling. But instead, he offers you to come back into the kingdom. One evening, a boy from a very wealthy family was listening to a phone call his father received. And they'd heard that a well-known Christian in the community was seen lying just drunk on one of the sidewalks. That's how drunk he was. He was just laying on the sidewalk. So the father sent his limousine to pick up the guy. And while he was doing that, the mother went up to their best guest bedroom. Beautiful antique four-poster bed, gorgeous coverlet on it. She pulled that back to reveal monogram sheets, just glorious. And the little boy said, Mom, you can't put him in here. He's drunk. He might get sick. Yes, the mom said, yeah. But this man has slipped and fallen. When he comes back to himself, He's going to be very ashamed, and he's going to need all the loving encouragement that we can give him. That's what God offers to us and invites us to offer people. Whatever rejection you're dealing with, know this truth, that God is welcoming you back, and God has better plans for your life. God offers you mercy, not rejection. When you fall and you fail, you can turn back to God. You don't have to lay in a ditch. You don't have to fall and just be lost. Whatever resources you have, use them to turn back to the Lord. But more than that, invite others to turn back to the Lord. Because when is the party happening in heaven? When one sinner repents and turns to the Lord, there is a celebration in heaven. There's only been a couple of recordances of celebrations in heaven when Jesus was born and when a sinner repents. Come back to the Lord. Don't let the ones who've hurt you and who've squished you, don't get back at them by trying to reject them. Instead, live with a purpose. Live with the purpose of loving others in Jesus' name. When you are confident that God loves you and you are living with Christ, then you can live in a powerful way. You can do things that are amazing, like forgiving someone and showing them God's love and mercy. God has good plans for us, but we need to live into them. When our life is full of love and acceptance, we will know a good way to live. And our relationships will be amazing. Think how better your life would be if you were a person who showed mercy instead of judgment. Think about never being rejected again. Because that's what heaven is like. And that's the great news of the kingdom, that rejection is not our way to live. But our way to live is through love and acceptance and power. That's our faith. Because in the name of Jesus Christ, friends, you are forgiven and accepted. In Jesus' name, you are loved. So go and show mercy. Because that's what God expects of us. Amen. Amen.